Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and just be part of this amazing conversation that's going on. Um, and I'm just delighted to share with you a little bit about what uh, we're doing and exploring in augmented reality. Um, as John said, my name is Julia. I'm with Novabuy. We are a 3D art production company. Our digital artists work with developers, designers, content creators um, like yourselves, and increasingly with end use customers to create the custom 3D assets and environments that they need to realize their creative vision. Um, our artists like me to call them the A-team or your A-team, so um, they're currently working across almost every market sector in the 3D content industry. Um, and while these things might look uh, very diverse from the end user's perspective and possibly from the consumer or um, developer's perspective, from the artist's perspective, um, these actually all look quite similar. Um, that's because all of the assets and artwork actually filter back to the same people, the same concept artists, the same animators, and the same 3D modelers. Um, but I will say about two years ago, uh, mobile augmented reality entered our orbit and has been rocking our world ever since. From the moment we got our hands on it, we said this is something different. Um, we were super excited about it because from our perspective, this is really the first time that the general public has been able to uh, see, experience, and even interact with the uh, artworks that we've been creating in 3D and doing it on devices that they already own and love. And we immediately saw the potential for broad public engagement and the possibility of doing good through this medium. Certainly, um, the Pokemon Go craze has demonstrated that the public is actually ready and willing and even eager to get outdoors and interact with augmented reality through their mobile devices, even if they don't always realize it's augmented reality and even if they don't always realize it's 3D content. But we, what we very quickly began to wonder is how can we leverage this power of Pokemon Go, this appeal, and get people to engage not just with their phones, but with their surroundings. Um, in other words, how can we move them from this to this and create greater awareness and interaction with their environment and their community? So towards that end, uh, we've started exploring space making and how augmented reality could enhance that. For those of you that might not be familiar with the concept of place, place is simply a space or location that has been imbued with meaning. And that meaning comes from the community and is usually derived from historical context, uh, social connections, and local culture. Um, We've all been in places, whether we know it or not. They range from the monumental that we all certainly recognize down to the little street parklets that are made out of a single parking spot. They can be very informal by, uh, and created by installing just a foosball table in a, in a park or installing um, a large artwork um, such as the Cupid's Arrow in Rincon Park in San Francisco. And art has actually played a large role in, this, in the placemaking movement. It's used to kind of activate um, that, the kind of space. So we began asking ourselves where we could um, potentially utilize augmented reality and transform some disadvantaged or underutilized spaces in our own backyard. And as John mentioned, we're based in Seattle, but we're act our team is actually located in both Seattle and San Francisco, and we have our origins in San Francisco as well. Um, the good news is that there's an increasing body of uh, evidence that when a, a space is transformed into a place, um, it actually increases the public sense of ownership in the space, which in turn results in greater safety and security of the area, increased social, social connections, and even increased commerce. The other good news is that placemaking, we're finding, is actually uh, pretty easy to achieve with some um, fairly minor interventions. Um, these are kind of highlighted up here. So on the inten intangible side, uh, if we engage the public in the transformation of the space, whether that's through design or the physical transformation, and certainly through the activities in the space, it really increases that sense of ownership. Second, if we make sure we're focusing on connecting that space to the local community, 
Third, that we make sure we design a very inclusive space, a very accessible space that is appealing to a broad demographic, particularly making the space family friendly. On the more tangible side, um, it can be as simple as installing seating. This kind of cracks me up. Apparently, we all like to sit around and talk and look at our mobile phones. A little news flash there. Um, other is providing interactive activities, activities that people can do um, individually or as groups. And then finally, just installing things that bring people joy and happiness and spark curiosity. And this is certainly where art has played a big role. So as I mentioned, we're based in um, both San Francisco and Seattle, and so we began looking for opportunities to where we could um, find or work with underutilized spaces in our own backyard. And we're fortunate to be connected with a number of community organizations in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco. Um, those of you from the Bay Area might know the Tenderloin um, by reputation, if not personally, as generally being considered um, the worst neighborhood in San Francisco. It has a number of challenges. Pretty much every challenge we're facing right now in the United States, whether that's um, drug addiction, homelessness, how we treat mental illness, how we treat immigrants, um, is all very conflated here and very visible on the streets. Uh, but there's also very um, uh, good parts of the Tenderloin, too. Uh, what a lot of people might not know, though, is actually the Tenderloin is not only the most challenging neighborhood in San Francisco, but it's actually one of the most challenging neighborhoods in the United States. Um, but it hasn't always been this way. It's always um, been kind of a rowdy, body area, but it's also been the home of a lot of San Francisco's innovation and creativity. Um, one of those seats of innovation actually was the Black Hawk Jazz Club that existed between the, excuse me, at the intersection of Hyde and Turk Street between 1949 and 1963. It was pretty much the blue note of the, of the day. Um, it's kind of one of the birthplaces of the West Coast jazz movement. And um, pretty much everybody who was anybody in jazz played there. It was internationally famous and the place to play. And people such as Dave Brubeck um, and the Dave Brubeck Quartet, who really changed jazz, called the Black Hawk their musical home. That's where he experimented with a lot of his um, unique time signatures and really reinvented the genre. Um, but today, there's a parking lot there. And that parking lot is frequently filled with bottles and cans and usually needles. Um, and frequently a few homeless as well. And so in talking with um, the community organizations that we're um, in partnership with, we thought, what if we could recreate the Black Hawk here in augmented reality? So that's what we've started to do. And we've started to kind of create a place, turn this space into a place through augmented reality. Um, what we loved about this is that it certainly uh, ignites um, awareness of the uh, positive aspects of the Tenderloin and its positive history, many of which even the uh, residents don't know about. Um, and it is accessible to them. Um, but it also is kind of this you know, kind of implicit um, subversive indictment of a lot of uh, these challenges and that we need to be taking on. Um, we are also able to connect this actually with some of the walking tours and have this be an asset that they're able to use. There's a couple nonprofit tour, tour companies in the neighborhood that benefit um, the local community. Um, but we, we didn't really want to stop there. We felt there was a lot more that could be done. So we've moved this into further design and planning. And we'll just kind of walk through in the last few minutes here of kind of how we're approaching this design and how we see um, augmented reality being able to be incorporated. So um, certainly the Black Hawk itself remains the anchor of the experience. Uh, we're fortunate that it has these fantastic billboards on the outside um, that were once used to advertise the upcoming acts and um, musicians that were, that were playing there. Um, but this provides a great opportunity to increase those links to the community. So uh, there's a lot of artists working in the Tenderloin because of its affordability. And so this um, provides an opportunity to display their work, um, whether those are physical or digital artists, can be uh, showcased in the experience. And there is a gallery walk through the neighborhood that this could provide an interesting tech addition to that. 
Also, we see an opportunity to connect this to local businesses, particularly local performance venues. So there's a modern um, current day jazz club called the Black Cat a couple blocks away. So this creates an opportunity for them to um, promote uh, their venue, perhaps through kind of a buy one, get one free ticket, or other performance venues in um, San Francisco, and possibly even SF Jazz. Uh, but we wanted to also go beyond just kind of representing the physical building um, and create kind of what the, the look and feel, what did it feel like to be at uh, the Black Hawk during that time when this incredible creativity and innovation was going on. Um, so towards that end, we're, we've been working on um, developing something for the inside. One of the first things we want to do is install uh, seating, kind of reminiscent of the cocktail tables and chairs that would have been in there. Um, but our approach for the inside experience is very different than for the outside. We felt it was important to be true to the um, kind of historical integrity of the building. But on the inside, we're kind of taking a set design approach, so um, where you, maybe you provide key pieces and then engage people's imagination to kind of fill that in, kind of the way you, when you go to see a play, you usually don't have a fully explicit set. But one of those key pieces we want to provide are augmented reality representations of the Dave Brubeck Quartet's instruments, which you can see here. And for those, we feel like we can take a very kind of family-friendly approach. So we're actually designing those to be somewhat kind of animated characters and that people can interact with those. So and when the experience starts, you would hear um, Dave, uh, music reminiscent of the Dave Brubeck Quartet and his unique time signatures. And then you could touch each of these instruments and kind of solo them. And we're also working with a sound designer to allow people to kind of recombine those and create their own time signatures and mini compositions. This also creates a unique uh, opportunity to tie in to other nonprofits um, in, the, uh, in the Tenderloin area. So for instance, the Salvation Army has a very uh, robust music program, music teaching program in, in the Tenderloin. And so this creates an interesting kind of outing experience for them and also potential outreach experience um, for them. But of those instruments, um, we've decided to make one of them a physical sculpture. Um, that's based on kind of our observations um, of how people are beginning uh, to interact with augmented reality, especially those that are not familiar with it. A lot of people still don't know what it is. Um, and even when you explain it to them, they just don't get it until they see it. So uh, we're working with a local artist to actually create an artistic, fun sculpture um, that will actually double as a seat as well. Um, and the idea is that that would kind of be, um, one, a visual indicator um, that something is there and act as a curiosity to, dr to draw people to it. Um, and then on a more practical level, it also um, creates a nice marker to initiate the augmented reality experience. So this is kind of what we're, we've been up to and how we're thinking about augmented reality, at least in terms of placemaking um, through mobile AR. Um, and I think as we kind of reflect back on the key tenets of um, placemaking, uh, it certainly touches on almost all of these. Um, augmented reality can enhance all of these, except perhaps the seating. But I think where we, we're finding the most value that it adds is kind of extending and deepening uh, the potential connections. We're able to connect this to the community in ways that we would never be able to do in the physical world. Um, or it would be cost prohibitive to do so. Um, and the same thing with the interactions. We're able to uh, provide more unusual um, interactions at a reasonable budget, and that we can also um, evolve the experience over time. So what we're anticipating doing is, as, uh, is highlighting different musicians, and as the performance um, venues change, as artists change, keep it fresh and provide uh, different experiences in the future. So again, that's what we're up to. Um, our motto at, at Novobuy is to make it real, but we're also working really hard to make what we do matter. So thank you very much.